Hey, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Blind Ambition with Jack Kelly. It's your friend, Rick from Blind, and today I'm going to introduce you all to Dr. Kyle Elliott, who's the founder, tech career coach, interview coach behind caffeinatedkyle.com. As a result of working with Dr. Elliott, senior managers and executives have landed jobs at these big name companies that you've all heard about. It's Amazon, that's Meta, that's Google, and nearly everything else that you can imagine in the world. So thanks for coming on the show, Dr. Elliot Kyle. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and speaking with you and Jack and the audience. For the benefit of everyone who might not have worked with a tech career coach, a professional coach, an interview coach, can you walk us through your career? I will walk backwards from where I am now. I'm a tech career coach. I primarily work with senior managers and executives who fall in two buckets. One is... I know what I want to do. I want a job at Amazon or Netflix or some hyper growth startup. Help me get that job. And another group is, I don't know what I want to do. Help me figure that out. So help them figure it out and then get in that bucket. But how I started here is different than a lot of tech career coaches. I didn't work in tech at a company or two and then launch a coaching business. I didn't work in HR recruiting. I actually started on a platform Fiverr. For those of you who are unfamiliar, you can literally pay $5 to someone to do a service for you. They can record your voicemail or create a logo. My service was reviewing resume, writing that about section on a LinkedIn profile, and that blew up. And fast forward 12 years later, that business kept growing, and now I coach people full time. In terms of your coaching in tech, how is it now? Because you hear about all these layoffs and downsizings and changes. Maybe you could level set, like what, what, what do you see in the marketplace? A lot of people ask me that. It's a difficult market. And I'm like, actually, I don't think it's necessarily difficult. I think it's just different. Your old job search methods of, I'm just going to apply to a bunch of jobs. It's not necessarily going to work at some of these companies. I do have clients who just go in blind, um, no pun intended, and apply to a bunch of roles and they'll get interviews, especially at top companies. But what you have to do now is be a lot more targeted because there's so a much AI and automation out there that I'll just apply for you, companies are getting literally thousands of applications for a single job. And that recruiter or hiring manager, it's difficult to sift through. So you have to be more targeted. When my clients are networking and reaching out to people, they're getting success. That's just one step. You also have to be qualified and match those roles you're looking for. So if you're really targeted with your approach, you're actually reaching out to people, then it's just a different job market. You just have to put more effort in for each application you submit than in previous years, maybe even two or three years ago where you just applied. And if you were qualified, you got called in. Kyle, can you elaborate on this? Because you mentioned these new tech things where you could apply really easily and then it just floods the market so that... If there's an opening, you could get hundreds and hundreds of people who apply. Yeah. So can you, for people who are frustrated, like what the heck is going on here? Can you maybe talk about like what type of programs these people are using to automatically send out their yeah. resumes? Some of it's LinkedIn easy apply. So they're just clicking through mm -hmm. there and applying. Other ones, there's AI software. I don't have a specific one I recommend because mm -hmm. I don't recommend it. But there's AI software you can buy or use that will apply for any job that fits a certain parameter. Or some people will hire a VA, a virtual assistant to just apply to a bunch of roles. There's tons of people applying for these roles, and oftentimes it's people who aren't always qualified or the best match. So that recruiter is having to sift through so many. And if someone who knows you can, hey, reach out to that recruiter or hiring manager, not just through the ATS, the applicant tracking system, but kind of a side door. And let's say I know Jack and Jack knows Rick and I want to work at Blind. I'm like, hey, Jack, can you email Rick real quick and have him look at my resume? You're going to have a way higher response than if I just applied cold on the Blind website, for example. And that's really what I mean when I say networking. It's just those personal connections. And you don't have to know Jack one-on-one. -on -one. It could even be, hey, I listened to your podcast. I love this episode of Kyle. And then I see Rick and Blind has an opening. And just spending that time, it doesn't have to be super time-consuming. I encourage people... Maybe set a timer for 10 minutes for each application you submit. Spend 10 minutes trying to leverage your network or building up your network of contacts at that company. So how do you do that? Because you hear the phrase networking and most people it's like, Ick. Yeah, you know, networking, going to like an event and you have like a label on your suit and you, yeah. you know, shaking hands, and you're all sweaty. What's like, how, what's the best way to network? Because you have to probably cultivate and build it. 
first, right? I hate networking in the traditional sense. I'm a huge introvert. It makes me sweat. I just, I'm not a fan of it. So I love technology because then it makes it easier for fellow introverts to then be watching Netflix at the end of the day and then just being on your phone and you can send a LinkedIn message or you can say, hey, Rick, I wanted to write for the blind blog. So I reached out to a co-founder I met blind at a conference and then they introduced me to Rick. So it's leveraging those connections and saying, how can I reach out to this person in a way where they're going to want to stop and read their email when they get hundreds of emails, if not thousands of emails every week. So it could be someone you met at a conference. I love using alumni. So going through your college or even your high school or a certificate program you went through and saying, who do I know? You can also use blind. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on this podcast, but a lot of my clients go to blind and say, let me go see who else works at these target companies and say, hey, you posted about working at this company. Can we chat real quick? And what's key is most people aren't going to do that. Everyone hears this advice, but most people don't. So when my clients do reach out to people, they're like, oh my gosh, I actually got a response from this VP at Meta, this director at Amazon, because a lot of people don't actually take anyone up on that offer to network. I really appreciate that breakdown. As Jack was alluding to, networking can seem very intimidating, especially if you're earlier in your career, or maybe you've only worked at one or two companies and you just think, well, my network is my company or my team, and I I can't let them know that I'm going to switch jobs. Maybe I'm stuck, but really it's It's these little things and and they really are very simple and they don't need to be too scary. I find sometimes people exactly think that, Rick, it's everyone at my company, but I've had clients, I say, what list do you have? And they say, oh, the PTA. Let me just go through the PTA contact list and start seeing where everyone works. I'm a member of a synagogue and we have a directory. Let me go through and see where everyone at my synagogue works or who they might know. My favorite is your phone. Get your phone and go to your contact list and see where people work. You can do the same with your LinkedIn contacts, your Instagram followers, or people who um, you follow, Facebook. And if you just start repeating that, you realize, oh my goodness, all these people, then all their friends, and you already have this network, even if you've only been at one company for a long time. Now, you've mentioned why someone might want to work with you or might want to start networking in terms of making that change, whether it's the Mm -hmm. job function, company. That can seem a bit scary, especially if you're moving industries or Mm -hmm. companies, going from maybe a smaller one to a larger one. Can you give us some advice there? What are you seeing among your clients that might be considering a switch? Oftentimes when people want to switch, they say, I want to go work for Microsoft, Amazon, Meta, these big tech companies, and they're coming from finance or somewhere. That's going to be a tough nut to crack trying to get into these big companies. So I'd first look at your own experience and say, are there overlaps between what I'm doing now and tech? Maybe I work in digital payments at my company. So maybe if I target a tech company, maybe a PayPal or a Stripe or something might make sense instead of just the ones with the biggest name recognition. You can use Blind, again, not just because I'm on the podcast, but go on Blind and look up the culture of these different tech companies or ask people, what payment platforms do you recommend? That can be powerful. And then I would go find, this is my biggest piece of advice, go find a job description at one of these companies and then rewrite your resume from scratch using that job posting. Because a lot of times, let's say you come from banking, they're going to be like, we have 12 million customers. Well, at a place like Stripe, they're called users, or they're going to be using different language. So you want to mirror your language off of that job description. So then they say, oh, it sounds like you've been doing digital payments for a long time, and you'd be great for Stripe or PayPal or Square, instead of talking like how people talk at Wells Fargo or Bank of America or JP Morgan Chase. Even though you're doing similar stuff, it's really translation. You have to translate your experience for that industry and really speak their language. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because if you come across using lingo or buzzwords or jargon that don't mesh up, it's just going to knock you out, I bet. Because they could say, hey, this person doesn't know anything about our industry. You know, they're using all the wrong terminology. Let me ask you this too. So it sounds like if you want to go to Apple or Amazon, what have you, it seems like you're saying maybe in part, go level under. You didn't say this, but I'm kind of yeah. inferring. Uh, well, maybe start that and maybe have a better chance to get Yeah, because the less people are going to apply. Those ones that are still great companies, but have maybe less name recognition. Yeah. So maybe they have 200 applicants instead of 1,000. I would suggest thinking of it like your investment portfolio and can you diversify it? Maybe a third of them are these really huge companies. Mm -hmm. 
everyone's applied to a third or maybe these still large ones, but not every single person is applying to. And then a third is maybe hyper growth startups or SMBs. So like your investment portfolio, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket, but you're targeting different ones. And if you're data driven, you can even see, okay, I applied to 10 really large companies, 10 mid-sized, 10 startup. What's my response rate? And then you can even do that A testing and seeing where you get the best response rate and then double down in that area. If you get a 90% response rate to SMBs and none to the big tech, okay, maybe that's where people see that you have the most transferable skills. Does it make a big difference because you're hearing a lot of layoffs and downsizing, hiring freezes to do your homework and see what's happening? Because otherwise, I imagine you get frustrated you know, that you're sending your resume, you don't hear back. Like, how do you navigate that? I think it's helpful to have some context of the market. However, when I coach people, I say, who's on this screen here? It's you and me. Mm -hmm. What's in our control? And it's helpful to be aware of the job market and make sure there's jobs out there you can apply to. But we can't really do anything, at least in the immediate term, you and I, about layoffs, about the number of jobs available. So I say, what's in our control? What can we augment? What can we optimize? Let's focus on that. And people will say, oh, but the layoffs and this, we can't do anything about that. What's in our control? I think that's the focus of coaching. People who are most successful in their job search, they say, this is in my control. Let me keep optimizing this and focusing on that. It's good to vent. You can have your kind of venting, set a timer for five or 10 minutes and vent and talk to some friends and be annoyed and then say, okay, let me go back and focus on what's in my control. In terms of other things that we can control beyond making sure you're networking, looking for those side doors, being pragmatic and realistic about what's going on in the industry, in the job market, what are other things that we can easily control, especially when we're out there trying to get another one? I think as Jack said, this kind of level below, or I call it a lily pad. Like if you want to go work in tech and you came from finance, is there this middle ground between maybe FinTech or something that's not pure tech where it makes sense for you? If I think of it as a Venn diagram, you want there to be a good amount of overlap between your current industry and current role and the new industry and new role. If you're going for your first time management role, for example, maybe leading one or two people or being a tech lead. Or if you're going for a tech company, making sure it's not the largest tech companies in the world. Yes, you can aim for those, but you're probably not going to be successful. So being realistic and targeting something that's in between your dream job and where you are now and being realistic and knowing that you maybe even need two lily pads before you go from a finance company to a meta or an Amazon or a Google. So what way you kind of pace yourself and not feel frustrated if you if you if you going to, you know, top bank company and it doesn't hit right away. Don't take mm -hmm. it personally. You, you might have to take some steps in between. Yeah, I would use LinkedIn or Blinds to even see two people who are in your target role. Think of it like market research. How did they get there? Did they come mm. directly from a company like yours or did they have some lily pads? What did their background look like? Clients will often ask me, can I land this job? Well, let's go see. Did other people in your role and from your company land this job? Let's go find 20, 30 people in your target role and see what their background looks like, their education looks like, what their LinkedIn looks like. And that can give you insights as to how you stack up to the competition. Can we talk about like who you know and make that recommendation? Because I think that's a really good way to get your foot in the door, to find okay. somebody you know at the company and have them share the resume and have them recommend you. So if you have 200 resumes to look at and, you know, Rick says, you know, Kyle is great and Jack says Kyle is great. And like, all right, there's 200 resumes. Let's just put Kyle to the top because it makes it easier. I love LinkedIn for that reason. There's a lot of easy searching to say like my first degree connections who work here or who used to work here. Sometimes people only look at who currently works there. And if people left without burning bridges, people still know their former colleagues from a place. So saying, hey, can you introduce me to this person? And oftentimes if someone doesn't even know someone that well, they'll still reach out to them. I often, I haven't been for a formal employer in quite a few years, but I'll still connect people to my old employers and say, hey, here's someone who wants to learn more about this company. Will you chat with them? So I'm a huge fan of using LinkedIn or other platforms to reach out to people who work at a target company or who used to work there. Same with the family and friends reaching out to them. That can be powerful to raise your resume and land that first round interview. You still have to do well in the interview, but it can help you get that first interview and get past those other 200 applicants who are just kind of 
going to be getting a five or 10 second screen by the recruiter rather than getting a real good read because they were referred. And I'm a fan, like you said, Jack, having multiple people refer you as well. Most people think you only need one person. But if I was hiring and eight different people emailed me saying, hey, you need to interview this person, I think that can Mm. be really powerful testament to how powerful of a candidate you are. Right, because it makes it easier because you're not sure you know, who do I go to? Who's the best person? But if you if you keep the same person keeps coming up, you say, you know what, let's go with that person, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's almost the path of least resistance. Like, all right, everyone seems to like yeah. this person. Let's funnel this person up to the top. I think of it like Yelp or a Google review or something like, okay, there's one or two five mm-hmm. stars, but if there's 10 of them. You really want to go to that place. It must be good. Or if there's a line out the door. So I would leverage that and have multiple people refer you if possible. I also find that the more senior you get, the expectation is almost there. You should have had greater scope or more project or more visibility. It's almost a red flag if you don't come in with a strong recommendation or a network, or you can't demonstrate that. Uh, Because part of that referral is being able to show, hey, I I do have these built-in relationships across the company, in my industry, in my specialty, Mm -hmm. um, already in hand. I totally agree. I think, too, it's part of the role as well. I think a role like yours, people want those relationships. And I think, too, if you're not used to doing that collaboration or if you're just existing in a silo, that can also be a red flag and backfire. If they're like, you don't know anyone, why? Were you just working on your own projects and not? communicating or collaborating with anyone else can be problematic. So I think it isn't just, do you interview well and have a good resume? But all of this is really an interview, you showing that you know how to network and build relationships, that you know how to reach out, that you know how to follow up. All of this is really the interview as well. I'm curious, for people who aren't familiar with tech interviews, how different is it when you do a tech interview as opposed to like a non-tech? Is it, do you have to know how to code? Can you, can you walk people through, especially for people who want to move over because they may feel like, oh gosh, I don't know how to code, so I'm going to get knocked out. Can, can you give some color on how that plays out? Yes. Such a good question. It's going to depend on the role. If your mm-hmm. role is going to involve coding, then you might be expected to code. If you're going for a higher level role, you might have to do a systems interview. If you're going to be presenting a lot in the role or collaborating with cross-functional teams, you might have a presentation interview. So it's going to depend on that role. What I love about a lot of these tech companies is that recruiter they're getting evaluated on the number of people who convert to offers oftentimes. So they're really going to help you. They're going to give you a lot of resources. Often they'll do interview prep with you. You can ask them for insights and say, hey, how do I best prep for this interview? It's going to vary a lot in the role, but they tend to be a little tougher, people find. There's more rounds of interviews. It could be four or six rounds or sometimes eight rounds of interviews because you're meeting with different people, that recruiter, the hiring manager, the panel a case study or a presentation, the coding, if it's a technical role. So it just tends to be more exhaustive and aren't as used to keeping that stamina up through all these rounds and this kind of 30 or 45 days of multiple interviews. That's interesting. So on average, how many rounds do you go through? Let's say kind of just say a mid-level person. It varies. Usually I'm saying like three or four interviews, maybe five. Um, from like the recruiter all the way through the hiring manager and final offer. Are you expected to sit down and write code like right in front of the interviewer? If you're targeting a technical role, you might be coding in front Mm -hmm. of them or they might have a coding challenge that you do offline in like an environment that's recorded or something. So depend on the company and the culture. A lot of clients like using an interview to tell them what kind of culture is this? Is this a more high stakes culture where you're going to have to code in front of people? that's really pressured? Is it more of one where you're going to have more time to think and reflect? With these interviews, it's important too. A lot of the interview isn't just you get the answer right, but how do you communicate? Do you ask the right questions? A lot of people, especially as they rise through the ranks, they get nervous about that. They think I have to come up with the right answer. But I've had clients who answer completely wrong and get offers because they really just want to see how do you communicate? How do you collaborate? How do you work in a stressful environment? That's what a lot of the interview is really about. Jack, what are you seeing on your side? How are interview lengths going? What do the case studies or stages look like? I don't know if you want to know the answer, right? Because this is oh, not... Oh, no. I, all right. I, Give it to us I, straight, Jack. I don't like being the bearer of bear news, but for uh, white-collar professionals lately, I'll give a technical term, it sucks. 
it's it's <laughs> it's really freaking horrible seriously this is it's really tough if you look at like, the monthly jobs reports when it comes to white collar workers terrible terrible like almost no yeah. hiring at all it's part-time jobs contract jobs is government yeah. jobs so actually it's really hard to find a job and yeah. it's so frustrating because you go send out resumes you see on linkedin where they give a counter now it caps it out like a hundred and i think they stop giving you know you know, anymore because it freaks the people out. Like, oh my God, how am I going to uh -huh. get a job? It's really brutally on the self-esteem and confidence of people because you know, they're sending out resumes. They don't hear back. They go no. for interviews. They go for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight interviews, and then they get ghosted. Yeah, And it's, it's, it's really, it's really rough. It's really tough. Now I'm generalizing. Does everyone go through that? No, but as a whole, the non-tech world it's it's very hard have you seen that too i know you specialize in tech kyle you i've see seen that, that. Yeah, yeah yeah there is a shift in hiring especially during the summer that happens as well it tends to be extended a lot of people on vacations and then it's like oh in two more weeks you'll have your next interview and then they're like oh another week because this person's out of the office so it just tends to be extended which can bring up a lot of anxiety and stress for people which can be really difficult and it's important to again focus on what's in your control and continue to follow up, continue to apply for jobs, everything in your control is important. When you see such a prolonged process and you're meeting with so many people, I mean, gosh, it must be the difficult the other way around with the hiring manager, they're meeting so many people. Can you give us some advice in terms of how we can stand out as a candidate? Are there any impactful questions or thoughtful questions or things that we can take on in terms of how we present our skills and background? I love that question. I asked job seekers, what sets you apart from all the other candidates? And a lot of them struggle. And I remind them, if you're getting interviews, they already know you're qualified. They're not going to meet with you when they have hundreds or thousands of candidates to choose from. They just think you're qualified. They know everyone here is qualified. So I encourage people to write down a list of 10 or 20 things I say that make them fabulous? What's your unique value proposition? What sets you apart from the other people? And then sprinkle those throughout the interview. You can literally have it written down on a piece of paper and check it off. So maybe it's you come from finance and highlight how that sets you apart. Maybe you speak multiple languages. Whatever it might be, I think it's key to remind them throughout the interview, here's what's different about me. I'm not just qualified for this role because everyone else who's a interviewing is qualified. It's to keep reminding them, here's what's unique and different about me compared to everyone else who's also qualified. The folks that you're coaching directly, they're a bit more experienced. Um, uh -huh. You know, they're senior, they fall into that bucket in terms of having this great wealth of examples to speak to. Generally, hiring managers, recruiters, are they putting a greater emphasis on more technical versus these so-called soft skills? You know, they're often described as kind of a spectrum. Do you see the market leading on one end to the other? I think it's in between. I think it's this relevant experience and you have to have the hard skills. You have to have done it before. They want someone who's really done it before. And if you're looking at a job posting and you haven't done this or something similar, they have so many candidates to choose from. But then on the flip side, they want those soft skills. They're going to be working with you eight, nine, 10 hours a day. They want to be able to communicate with you, collaborate with you, enjoy meetings, all of that. Both are really important in those interviews to be able to showcase your skills. Oftentimes, it's a lot of little things. I think of it like the Olympics. Really, you're competing against the best of the best. If you've made it to those interviews, maybe you're the top five out of a thousand people who applied. So you're the best of the best. And now it's those teeny little tweaks that can make a difference. And they're often little tweaks no one's pointed out to them before. What kind of tweak? What's the secret? Yeah. Yeah. Usually it's people not owning what's unique or different about them, or they're not backing it up. They're not sharing examples. They're like, oh, I'm a great team leader. Oh, I'm really compassionate or have empathy, but they don't give any examples or back it up. Other times they're using a lot of we. That's one of my pet peeves when working with people and they go into interview, they just say we, we, we. And it's really difficult to discern, like, were you just part of this team? And they're like, no, I love this entire initiative, but it's really unclear as me listening to them what they did. Um, the other is evidence. A lot of times they just go in and speak really broadly, but there's no specifics that allow me to imagine them succeeding in that role. And then with tech folks, sometimes they just don't 
um, share any of their personality. I will hear them speak for a while and I didn't really learn anything about them. Like you've shared some examples, but I don't know anything about you. And really people are hiring other people and we want to know more about who you are as a human. Hmm. Would that would that mean kind of almost telling a story about who you are, what you're about, why you you want this job, why you want this company? And you want to keep it compact because you don't want to bore them. But is that mm -hmm. something you suggest to people and they'll Absolutely. choose you as, so, you know, as opposed to someone else who just want to have Amazon on my resume. Exactly. People aren't going to remember a billion dollars of these sales or this number of users. People are going to remember those stories and say, Ooh, that was the guy that did this. And really those stories that are really memorable, unique, sticky, that then after they've had 10 interviews, met with 40 people over the week with all their different work meetings. They're going to then be like, oh, that was the guy that this. You want to have those sticky, memorable stories that resonate. I'm, I'm going to do something dangerous. I'm going to pull on this thread and, and keep pulling. Are there any other common mistakes that you see candidates making, especially in this super competitive job market we have here? Yes. Something I find, actually wrote an article for Blind about this, is when people share stories, a lot of people use the STAR method. Situation task, action, result, to answer behavioral questions. I like that method. But I recommend a fifth portion, tying it back. A lot of times, especially when people make career changes, if they pivot, as we said, from finance, for example, to tech, they don't tie it back. They say, here's this great story from Wells Fargo, and then you're applying to, let's say, PayPal. But they don't tie the story back. They just give an example. I think of it like a present. And they say, hey, here, Jack, is a cheese board. And you're like, it's July. Why are you giving me a cheese board? And they don't connect the dots. I think of the tie like wrapping paper in a bow. You have to explain, here's why I'm giving you this gift. And connect the dots for them or wrap it. And that's really important. Every time you share a story, you want to say, here's why I'm giving you this story. And how my experience from Wells Fargo relates to PayPal, for example. And you can even say, here's why I'm sharing this story with you and how it relates. Even though that was a um, bank, here's how it relates to digital payments. And with that story, even if it's only a sentence or two at the end, you're really helping them understand how your experience is relevant. I love that advice because I, I've seen this trend where folks almost seem like, oh, well, you know, my, my experience should speak for itself. And I, I'm sharing this example because, well, they asked me about it. They should know how it connects but really explicitly in your face, laying it out for mm -hmm. them. You know, it's not too aggressive. You're not mm -hmm. doing it without tact. It's literally what yeah. they want to see, right? Yeah. You can even tie it back to their question, like, oh, this is just one example of how I've done this. And you're just connecting it, putting that bow on it at the end. I find that really helps set people apart, tying it back to just make it crystal clear. Speaking of tying it back, what do you, when, when, you said about like five, six, seven, ten different interviews. Do you suggest to people for each to have like your your story, but then tailor it? If I'm speaking to HR, I'm going to go a little different. If I'm speaking to my direct manager that I'm going to work for, tailor it that way and so forth. Would you coach people to have your core story, but then tweak it depending on who you're speaking with? and not worry that you're saying the same thing to everybody. Yeah, I think of the stories like a sandwich. The middle of the story can be the same, mm -hmm. and then you tailor it depending on who it is. At the beginning, you can also have some bread at the beginning. The tea is kind of like the bottom piece of bread. Depending on the recruiter, they're going to want to know something different. Like, yes, I have experience in product. Can I give a story and then tie it back then? Mm -hmm. This is one example of product. If you're speaking to an executive, it might be more high level. Yes, I've worked on a lot of products that have directly impacted revenue growth. Here's a story. That's one example, and that's your bread at the bottom. So the middle, the meat or the eggplant or the cheese is going to stay the same. And then the bread on the top and bottom, you're going to change depending on their question and depending whether you're speaking to the executive or the recruiter or the hiring manager. Just to take a sidestep a little bit, I see on Blind all the time where it's like, oh, do I take this job with Apple or do I take this job with Amazon or I'm E level seven or this? How do you coach people to take this company versus another? you know, company where we're presuming that the person has the background experience yeah. to decide like, which is better? Is it money oriented? Is it prestige? Oh. Can you give some color? And this is not just tech. This is kind of yeah. also oh, on tech too. Like, what would you yeah. suggest to people who come to you, not sure, and they yeah. want to 
go to these different types of companies. It's the same way I would approach trying to buy a house or look mm -hmm. for a rental or where you're going to go on vacation. I'd create a rubric and say, what do you need in your next job? What do you want or don't want? And then what's a deal breaker? And ideally, I do this before you start looking for jobs and say like, okay, I need this certain salary or I need it to be in tech or I want to manage people in getting really clear what category things are in. I say, we can't have them in more than one. You either need to say, I have to manage people or I want to. Let's put it in a certain category. So then when you get to this stage where you have multiple offers, you really don't have to think that much. You just go through and see which one lines up the most. And some clients are really technical, so they'll literally create a spreadsheet and they'll have weights and they're like, this job's 704 points and this job's 802 points. Other clients, they're like me, it's more just like check marks, which one lines up more. But I find that to be helpful before you get in the emotions of having multiple job offers. You can really just think about what's important. And if you have a partner, family, you can go through and reflect and say, is it job title that's important? Is it salary? Is it commute? Maybe I need to be within 30 minutes of my house, 15 minutes, and really reflect on all of that. And that list might adapt as well as you're interviewing places. You may be like, this person's a micromanager. I can't have that. Let me add that to that list. Some people have maybe two items on their list. Other clients have had over 40 items on their list. They're really picky or particular and have certain things on their list that matter to them. But I find that to be helpful to have that rubric. So then when you get to that decision point, you don't get overwhelmed with your options. I'm I'm, I'm going to take advantage of the your, your coaching here. If I'm starting from scratch and I'm trying to build that rubric and I just have no idea, maybe I'm miserable in my current job. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've been laid off for quite mm -hmm. a few months and I say, you know what? I'm not going to be picky. Maybe I just want anything. How can you help me build that structure and build yeah. that rubric for me to make my decisions? I get that a lot, Rick. I love that. I would say, well, it's miserable in your job. Let's start adding that to your list like let's say okay i'm miserable about my boss okay what about your boss do you not like let's add that or what would you like in your boss or what would you like day to day let's add that a lot of my clients i'm like let's delegate your homework let's text three or five friends and ask them what would make rick happy what would he like in his job and have them do some of your homework the same with company if you're like i don't know what companies to look at ask some friends where should i work i don't know what jobs to do ask friends so whenever you're stuck that's my favorite place to kind of go is to survey people around you. That's why I love Blind too. You can go on there and say, what should I do for a living? What companies should I work at? I would delegate when you're stuck. I really appreciate that advice. I've worked with a previous manager and they've given me this framework in terms of folks have superhero skills, things that are, are really great. But then each of these skills, they actually have a quote unquote shadow. So if you are a perfectionist, that shadow might be that it takes a while for you to get things done, right? Mm -hmm. Or you're really into micromanaging others, right? These kind of things may be natural extensions of, of certain things or certain skills. So if you don't have an idea of what matters most, the opposite might be actually more revealing. It can be powerful. Kyle, thank you so much for your wisdom. Thanks, Kyle. That was great. Thank you for having me. That's it for The Blind Ambition. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star rating and a review. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.